One day, many years ago, a brig cast off from her moorings and sailed from a British port for the polar seas. That brig never came back. Many a kind wish was uttered, many a handkerchief was waved, and many a tearful eye gazed that day as the vessel left Old England and steered her course into the unknown regions of the far north. But no cheer ever greeted her return. No bright eyes ever watched her homeward-bound sails rising on the far-off horizon. Battered by the storms of the Arctic seas, her sails and cordage stiffened by the frosts, and her hull rasped and shattered by the ice of those regions, she was forced on a shore where the green grass has little chance to grow, where winter reigns nearly all the year round, where man never sends his merchandise and never drives his plow. There the brig was frozen in, there for two long years she lay unable to move, and her starving crew forsook her. There, year after year, she lay unknown, unvisited by civilized man, and unless the wild Eskimos have torn her to pieces and made spears of her timbers, or the ice has swept her out to sea and whirled her to destruction, there she lies still, hard and fast in the ice. The vessel was lost, but her crew were saved, and most of them returned to tell their kinsfolk of the wonders and dangers of the frozen regions, where God has created some of the most beautiful and some of the most awful objects that were ever looked on by the eye of man. What was told by the fireside long ago is now recounted in this book. Imagine a tall, strong man of about forty-four, with short, curly black hair, just beginning to turn grey, stern black eyes that look as if they could pierce into your secret thoughts, a firm mouth with lines of goodwill and kindness lurking about it, a deeply browned skin and a short, thick beard and moustache. This is the portrait of the commander of the brig. His name was Harvey. He stood on the deck close by the wheel, looking wistfully over the stern. As the vessel bent before the breeze and cut swiftly through the water, a female hand was raised among the gazers on the pier, and a white scarf waved in the breeze. In the forefront of the throng, and lower down, another hand was raised. It was a little one, but very vigorous. It whirled a cap round a small head of curly black hair, and a shrill hurrah came floating out to sea. The captain kissed his hand, and waved his hat in reply. Then, wheeling suddenly around, he shouted in a voice of thunder, "'Mind your helm there. Let her away a point. Take pull on these foretopsail halyards. Look alive, lads.' "'Aye, aye, sir,' replied the men. There was no occasion whatever for these orders. The captain knew that well enough, but he had his own reasons for giving them. The men knew that too, and they understood his reasons when they observed the increased sternness of his eyes and the compression of his lips. Inclination and duty. What wars go on in the hearts of men, high and low, rich and poor, between these two? What varied fortune follows man, according as the one or the other carries the day? Please, sir, said a gruff, broad-shouldered, and extremely short man, with little or no forehead, a hard, vacant face, and a pair of enormous red whiskers. Please, sir, Sam Baker's took very bad, and I think it would be well if you could give him a little physic, sir, a tumbler of Epsom, or something of that sort. Why, Mr. Dicey, there can't be anything very far wrong with Baker, said the captain, looking down at his second mate. He seems to me one of the healthiest men in the ship. What's the matter with him? Well, I can't say, sir, replied Mr. Dicey, but he looks horrible bad, all that yellow and green about the gills, and fearful red about the eyes. But what frightens me most is that I heard him groaning very heavy about a quarter of an hour ago, and then I saw him suddenly fling himself into his hammock and begin blubbering like a child. Now, sir, I say, when a growed man gives way like that, there must be something far wrong with his inside, and it's a serious thing, sir, to take a sick man on such a voyage as this. Does he not say what's wrong with him? asked the captain. No, sir, he don't. He says it's nothing, and he'll be all right if he's only let alone. 
I did hear him once or twice muttering something about his wife and child. You know, sir, he's got a young wife, and she had a baby about two months before we came away. But I can't think that's got much to do with it, for I've got a wife myself, sir, and six children, two of them being babies. And that don't upset me, and Baker's a much stronger man. You are right, Mr. Dicey. He is a much stronger man than you, replied the captain, and I doubt not that his strength will enable him to get over this without the aid of physic. Very well, sir, said Mr. Dicey. The second mate was a man whose countenance never showed any sign of emotion, no matter what he felt. He seldom laughed, or if he did, his mouth remained almost motionless, and the sounds that came out were anything but cheerful. He had light gray eyes, which always wore an expression of astonishment, but the expression was accidental. It indicated no feeling. He would have said, Very well, sir, if the captain had refused to give poor Baker food instead of physic. And hark'e, Mr. Dicey, said the captain, don't let him be disturbed till he feels inclined to move. Very well, sir, replied the second mate, touching his cap as he turned away. So, murmured the captain, as he gazed earnestly at the now distant shore, I'm not the only one who carries a heavy heart to see this day, and leaves sorrowing hearts behind him. 